Don't hate on Jersey City. All right, guys. Okay. Um, you know, just... <laughs> um, that's Aaron, or that's Jag Deep's background. That wasn't Jag that's Deep's my, earlier. Right, so let's begin with the uh, presentation. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Can everyone see a black background and yellow wording? Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay, now Beautiful. You can mute, uh, you can mute uh, your thing and let's go to it. I tried to put together a presentation that uh, had uh, some background on what we are doing before we really get into analysis. The plan would be for me to set up the conceptual base. You can ask me any question by um, speaking in the middle. <clears throat> And then I'll turn over to David to talk about the data. Uh, he's been gracious enough to let us use a portion of the data. You should have a copy of the data with you. Uh, it's products and services to different groups. We'll be doing multiple group analysis. And I'll turn over to Aaron, who will do the metric uh, invariance, which you're quite familiar with. And then I'll take over in terms of scalar and uh, mean, or maybe mean invariance. So let's dig into it and see what we're trying to do. Um, okay, so the first slide is talking about different kinds of differences we want to test for. So you can have hypotheses uh, for different things, and I'm just going to go through each one of them. The first one is the hypothesis concerning mean differences. This is mostly common in ANOVA kind of design in experiments. You want to know if the mean of a deep end variable is different for two treatment groups. Uh, so that's the, the typical hypothesis for mean effect. Slope effect is most common in regression, where if you have two substantive variables, x and y, you want to know if the effect of x and y varies between groups, and you want to make a hypothesis about it. Corresponding to the slope, which is an aggression, you are familiar with the um, latent slope effect, meaning I think most of you are doing a study uh, in which there is hypothesis about latent slopes, which are simply the coefficients of, of path in a SEM model. And essentially you're saying after accounting for measurement error and equivalence and common method and so on, Relationships among substantive latent construct FX and FY, they vary predictably across groups. That's what you are uh, making hypotheses for. We don't do uh, the last piece as often. It should be done, uh, as I will explain in a minute how they can add insight, which is latent mean and slope effects, meaning not only one, I want to examine if the slopes are different in two groups, but also if the means of construct are different in the two groups. So in some ways, we're combining the ANOVA design within a regression design. But the word latent is important. We are looking at means after accounting for measurement error, equivalence, common method, and whatever else you are controlling for. So these are more rigorous tests of mean and slopes. And AMOS allows us to do this quite easily, although the setting up is quite complicated. Um, but that's the intention behind it. Why are we interested in mean and slopes? Uh, here is a figure to explain it. So uh, this graph tells us how a latent slope difference will look like for two groups. The two groups are uh, uh, low and high, red and black shown here. The two variables are fx and fy. And you're simply testing if the slopes are different for the two groups or not. In this case, we want to know if 127 is different than 151. 
we do that in uh, AMS by having these managed models, constraining the two to be equal, and then checking for chi-square difference to be significant or not. You're all familiar with this, but here there's another uh, way of uh, looking at some hypotheses. Again, fx and fy, again, two lines representing the two groups. But in this case, the slopes are not different. The number is 0.27. It may not be exact, but you're saying in the hypothesis testing it's not significant, so they can be estimated to be equal. But they are not the same. The means of fy in this particular two group example are not the same. So in the high group, the mean of Fy is less than the mean of the low group. And we would miss that latent mean difference if we did not estimate it and hypothesize it. Uh, so we tend to miss it. The third graph, which is the one we are going to be doing this afternoon, is both means and slopes. So in this example, we have again Fx and Fy. Again, two lines representing the two groups. In this case, the means are different. The high group has a lower mean than the low group, but also the slopes are different. The high group has a more positive slope, whereas the low group has a less positive slope. And these can be all tested statistically to be significant using the management models idea within A. This is basically the theory behind what we're going to be doing. Um, just want to see if any questions that I can answer at this point. I'm good. Assuming, I'm assuming all are good, so I'm going to proceed ahead unless somebody stops me. Uh, the next piece I'm going to look at is uh, some ideas going back to 1988. Uh, there's a nice paper written by Anderson and Verbain. It caused a lot of stir at that time. These uh, authors were chastised for proposing a two step method, but it took almost 10 years for that two step method to be reinstated as a good idea. And basically, what they were saying was that don't do your SCM with the measurement and structure together in the first go, but do them in two steps. Step one, make sure your measurement model is adequate, and by that I mean test the measurement model, allow the living variables to correlate, adjust it so that you have good fit. If the model of this, if the fit is not good, don't test for structural model. And this I want to point out, I really mean the measurement model without the error covariance. Because I said before that every time you allow that, you weaken your measurement model. And the fact that the measurement model is necessary but not sufficient condition for the fit of the structural model, which means, really means that these two are quite different things and should not be mixed up. Uh, measurement models should not be mixed up with structural models, but they need to be estimated in the last step as one big model to allow for this maximum likelihood estimation with full information. But to do that in the first instance can be problematic. We have an example of this, a uh, very good example of this. In the Meyer paper you are um, working with and revising. If you remember in that paper, they found invariance in the structural model but when you do your own analysis, you'll find, and I know some of you did find it, um, but there's a reason you didn't, and we will have an uh, analysis of that as well. When you really do it the right way, there are uh, paths which are quite different. And the reason they didn't find it is because the degrees of freedom that come from the measurement model are so huge that they don't allow any differences in the structural model to be detected. So for example, if you had 488 degrees of freedom and 400 came from the measurement model, 88 from the structural model, and that would happen if you had lot of items and uh, the measurement model is quite complex, then of course any misfit at the structural model would be overpowered by good fit at the measurement model. So they would um, 
compensate each other and you would not pick it up. And that's another reason to then step on. All right, let me move ahead now. And uh, this Excuse is a me. summary of uh, the two separate theories idea. I discussed that in the last residency. Not only are measurement model and structural model different things, they are about different theories. So measurement theory is about mechanisms that produce responses to survey items. They have to do with how the items are constructed. They have to do with the uh, scale you are developing, which is unperturbed by samples, context, and time. That's why invariance of the measurement model is so crucial. You're basically saying the scale can differentiate reliably and validly samples from different countries, from different groups, from different organizations. And as you can tell, without that, you cannot test your hypothesis. Different theory. Structural theory is about relationships among the living constructs. That's typically what you mean by theory in the program. We don't do much of the measurement theory, but actually there's a whole body of work on this theory. And in structural theory, you're interested in whether the relationships differ for different samples, context, and time. This tells us how different groups behave. And the key point here is you cannot do the structural model analysis of differences unless you can prove that your measurement model is invariant, meaning that you have to show that the mechanisms are unperturbed by variability in samples, context, and time for the measurement model to find differences for samples, context, and times for the structural model. Are we good? Move ahead. So, Jadeep and Lori, so yeah. we, we can't really do, with it on our own studies, we can maybe split our sample size into two pieces, but we can't change context or time, probably, right? You're right. Uh, I think many of the studies are not designed to do multiple group analysis, uh, or they could have been in design, I think. But what I said in the class is that when you are reporting your results, you're basically saying that you take my data and you can split it any way you want, and you should get the exact similar coefficient that I'm reporting. So it's not a bad idea that even if you had not planned it, to do a supplemental analysis where you take any of the background variable of the organization or the individual, and you break your data into two groups, and just work through to make sure that your coefficients, which means structural coefficients, do not change dramatically for the two groups you created. Because we can tell if they did vary a lot, significantly that is, then the coefficients you are reporting, which are averages across groups, are not that useful for interpretation. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. But Jagdeep, can't we, I, I know that we can break our data into different samples. Um, and I agree with Lori that we can't break it into different times. But I think we can break it into different contexts, can't we? Absolutely. You don't have to do all three. I mean, you can do by samples, by context. I think most of you don't have longitudinal data, so you can't do it by time. But if you did, that would be a way to do it. So take anything, any one of these areas, and uh, just go through to make sure that your results are uh, unperturbed by the groups that you create. All right, so let me proceed. I assume everyone is good with that. So the key article you need to keep in mind that, uh, is this article published in 2004. Yes, many others now that uh, go into more detail. But this is a good uh, sound uh, discussion of this approach. 
I slap Roy Hart and Oswald. Um, I think I'll ask Aaron to have a copy available for you if you want to dig into it. Uh, and it's added in all uh, articles which are this type. They lay out the entire set of procedures that you must follow in order to work through it. But really, in implementation, there are many tacit kinds of things which they don't tell you. And when I go through it today, you've got to, you must keep an eye on those because there's small little things that can throw you off and burn a lot of time. So just pay attention to what I'm going to be indicating as supplemental information as you read that article. Um, the approach is called MAX, um, which is, uh, stands for Mean and Covariance Analysis, I think, um, because it's doing both mean and covariance on variables. And I'm going to, it says there, you can, it's based on the idea of several nested models. We have done that. We've done these models which are nested using the average models. So you're familiar with that. You can add the common method factor in each group uh, if you wanted to. It gets complicated. Uh, and the last one is instrumental variables. And this you probably haven't done, uh, but in most survey research, there is a lot of concern about all kinds of biases, social desirability, and so on. And if you have included a variable of social desirability, uh, then you can also include this that variable within this design uh, so that you can remove it. In fact, it is possible to do that. Okay. And the different models we have to estimate, there are seven of them, although the article has additional ones, but I don't think you really need them. These seven are critical. I think you're quite familiar with the first two, configural and metric. And configural, you know, is about the item loading pattern. Metric is about item loading, meaning the exact loading are equal or not. And then we have scalar, which is the item intercepts. I spoke about that last sufficiency. There's residual invariance, residual invariance which is for the item error variances. We haven't done that. Factor variance and variance, which are really factor variances. We have not done that either. And the last two are corresponding to latent means and slopes. So factor mean and variance is about latent mean. And factor coefficient and variance is about latent slopes. We are most interested in six and seven. But we can't get there till we go through the entire set of procedures. But if you ask me which of these are the critical ones, and here there's a slide I think you really need to pay attention to in order to uh, work through this. Uh, you definitely need metric invariance to proceed, but a partial invariance is absolutely fine, which means for the majority of your items, but not all of your items, you meet the property of metric invariance. Scalar invariance is absolutely essential. Um, but again, not all items have to pass that. A partial is okay. And the partial, we mean majority of items. And the idea there is that as long as the construct can be identified by a majority of items, the remaining items can be uh, variant, both metric and scalar. The trick here to remember is that for any one given item, if it does not meet the metric invariance property, it should also be released from testing for scalar invariance, which means for each item, metric and scalar is like a pair. The item must meet the, both the properties in order for us to be able to use it. Is that point clear? I just want to make sure we are not missing that piece. I don't hear a sound. Everyone speaking? Okay. I think it's fine. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. So, Jadik, what, what I heard you say was, it's Lori again, was that although you'd like to have every item load the same and every intercept be the same, that if you get the majority of them to do that across your groups, that's good enough. 
that is good enough. Yeah, you will rarely get all of them. It's not going to happen. So majority is sufficient. But the last thing I said was it's like a pair for each item. That is, for the majority of items, both metric and scalar should be fulfilled. It can't be that for some item you have metric and for other items you're scalar. It's for the same set of items. You should have both properties. Open. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah, right. thank you. Below that, you see some uh, crossouts, residual and factor variance and variance. These are not necessary conditions for us to get to where we want to go. We are not, we are not in the business of testing for invariance to the last dot, uh, as psychometricians would want to do. Uh, instead, our goal is to check for latent mean and latent slopes, which are the two red things at the, at the last two points. Um, and for us to get there, we need metric and scalar, but we don't need residual, really. And we don't need factor variance. The factor variance is good to have, but it's not necessary. We can estimate it to be different. But the two things we're interested in are the factor mean invariance and factor coefficient invariance. That is our structural hypothesis testing. They relate back to the graphs I showed you in the beginning about slopes and means. And to, uh, to get there, all you need to pass is one, two, and three. I show a red line to them only to mean that our hypothesis most of the times is that we would not find invariance here, that the groups would be different. So we want to reject that hypothesis of invariance uh, to then understand why the two groups are different. Whereas for the measurement part, one, two, three, you want to accept the invariance. And just to complete, if you don't clear up one, two, and three, you cannot do six and Any questions at this point? None for me. Shagdeep, it's Adrian. Um, um, Sorry. I, um, why is six and seven crossed out? Because, you know, like a half an hour from after our class, and I go back to my notes and I see six and seven crossed out, I, it, it appears that you're, you're saying that it's, um, we don't need it, but I thought you said that it is needed. I'm a bit confused. Yeah, yeah. So the red color means that is our focus. Uh, we want to get to six and seven. This, the double strike to means our hypothesis normally is about rejection of invariance, meaning the two groups would be different means and they will have different slopes. So males are different than females. That's the kind of conclusion we want to draw. So the the double strike through is about our expectation of rejecting that. Whereas uh, one, two, and three, our expectation is to accept the event. I think that this is all Adrian. I think what Jagdeep is trying to say is that. By the time we get to six and seven, we actually want to show that there is a difference between the groups. Otherwise, yeah. why bother doing the work? Yeah. But the only way to say that they're different with meaning is to make sure that the, the difference doesn't happen at the measurement level. That's right. That the difference actually happens in the behavior level. That's right. And so that's why we have to say that the metric and scalar measures that we use are invariant. But what we want to lead to is that there are differences between the groups, but those differences are explained behaviorally and not through our measurement. That's right. Yeah, so, so to me, six and seven is more of an analytic concept, whereas one, two, and three are more mechanical. Mechanical. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I hope one day you would also think of one and two, three as analytical and conceptual. This has six and seven on, but they're totally different things. But for the moment, that's not. Okay, so let's now go to. Uh, I'm just going to. Uh, this is the most important slide. 
you'll be surprised how often you even miss this as I go through the steps. Uh, but uh, just keep an eye on what I'm going to say here. Before you do the multiple group, uh, I think the initial checks, most of you should be familiar with this. That is, uh, it is always a good idea to run separate analysis in each group before you do multiple groups so that you can ensure that the hypothesized model fits the individual group data well. Um, so before you go to multiple group again, do the individual groups, make sure the measurement model is working out right. Now always run EFA to cross check, and I, I think I mentioned that to Joe as well uh, in Joe's presentation, that when you have, and Nicholas as well, I think, even though your CFA looks great, uh, and I hope there also we should not just focus on model fit. The coefficients and t values are very, very important. They must be large and significant. But even a more significant idea is once the CFA looks good, go back and run an EFA just to make sure there is no uh, cross loadings which are not detected and picked up in CFA. And remember the rule. If the bases of freedom are large, small places of misfit will be overshadowed by the overall good fit of the model. So it's good to check the effect. You will pay a price down the road if that is not good. So it's a good idea to do that. The last bullet there is uh, in these complex analysis, it always helps to have good starting values. But it's not relevant for Amos because Amos doesn't allow you to put in uh, starting values. So you can ignore that. Um, but for other software, it is possible. Let's go to identification. Uh, there are, in when you do multiple group analysis with means and slopes, there are two ways of identifying each construct in your model. And you use any one of the two. You don't use both, you use one of the two. The first one is called the reference group method. And we call this reference group, meaning that one of the groups is going to be a reference group for us, a baseline group which we will use for comparison. So if you're doing males and females, you have to decide which group is your reference group. Let's say that's male. And you're going to then look at the, the female group with respect to this reference, male. Why do we have to do a reference group? Because when we're doing a latent variable uh, hypothesis testing, we don't have a real variable to work with. Everything is relative to something. And for that reason, a reference group has to be identified, which will become the point of reference for all other groups in your comparison. If you have five groups, you have to choose any one of them as a reference group, and the remaining groups can be compared with respect to that reference. You'll be doing a two-group analysis today, and I will be choosing one of the groups as a reference group. And for the reference group, the latent variance is set to one. This you know from uh, what you normally do in a CFA, but the latent mean also should be set to zero or fixed to zero for the reference group. And what that means is that the uh, reference group will have a mean of zero, and then all other means will be estimated with respect to this reference group. So that's one way of identifying. The second way is called the marker variable method, uh, which means you fix the loading of any one item for that construct to one or to any other value. So it doesn't have to be always one. You can choose a value that you prefer, uh, but it has to be fixed to that value. And its intercept also has to be fixed to a value zero or any other value you like in one of the groups. So you take one group, take one item for each construct, you fix its loading and its intercept to some values. In this case, the example shows one and zero, but they don't have to be one and zero. They can be any values needed 
to identify a latent construct. We have done this in your analysis for every dependent variable, uh, because for dependent variables, you cannot set the variance of the latent variable. That method is called the marker variable method. And what I said here is you choose one of the two, which means you can't do both. Um, we will begin with the one I circled. Uh, that will be the more common um, way we will be using it. But uh, we'll be shifting between the two because the analysis requires us to do that. So we have to be fully adaptable to move between the two choices as the analysis will demand. But at any one given time, we'll only use one. Now I want to stop here to make sure everyone gets the idea. Keep going. All right. I think it might make more sense when we see it. Excuse me? I think it might make more sense when we see it. All right, sounds good. Uh, let me go to the metric constraints. Uh, when we're doing the metric uh, equivalence, we don't need to include intercepts, only the means in this step. We should only do it for scalar. Uh, and factor loading is what the focus would be. You'll be fixing the living variances to one in both groups. You're all familiar with this, so let's dig into it. Um, but in the scalar constraints, when you do scalar analysis, we'll be using means and intercepts, and we'll be using different methods for identification, as I mentioned to you. And uh, the last bullet won't make sense to you now, but when you get into it, you will see how. You need, you need to wait. I'm going to um, this is, I'm going to skip this, this step about residual constraints. This is the residual error variances. You will follow the same plan as for the scalar, but since it's not critical for our analysis today, I'm going to skip that. And uh, this I will talk about as we go through the steps. I'm going to turn over to David uh, so that he can talk about the data. Okay, um, this survey had 49 questions, uh, and I can uh, elaborate a little bit more on those if you like. But for now, we'll uh, say it was a very quick survey. Uh, when we did the pilot pre-test, most of the executives that we tested took less than seven minutes to do it, so it was a very fast survey. We received 343 responses, and we sent out a significant amount of emails. Uh, and breakdown of the questions um, of which most of these are the IVs except uh, environmental behavior and safety behaviors were the DVs. The mediators were uh, mindfulness, uh, learning orientation, and absorptive capacity. So uh, any questions on that? Um, out of the uh, constructs, constructs that we selected for this uh, example, uh, we had mindfulness, which had four items. Uh, absorptive capacity had six, and the safety had um, three. And uh, Jagdeep, I think after um, watching Aaron's video, it may be interesting to go back and visit question 49 and why it came up to be um, not invariant. Um, we had 183 responses for uh, companies who worked for uh, what we call manufacturing companies. They make things, capital goods. And about 147 or 147 were companies that uh, we provided, or as we called service providers, financial industry or the uh, IT industry. Okay. Anything else? Uh, thank you, David. Let's move on to the next step. Um, okay. I think I'm going to turn over to... Uh, so, so now what we're going to do is uh, go to the actual um, AMOS um, runs and the way you set it up. Uh, from measurement, from metric to scalar. So I'm going to turn over to Adam. Uh, who would uh, go to the metric in there?
I can see a cursor moving back here. Anybody? Am I the only one? I don't hear anything. Say that again, Lori. Oh, good. So it's not just me. I can't hear anything. Yeah, I have no. Uh, Right. How about now? Can you hear me? Oh, Aaron, there you yeah, are. Yes. There you are, Aaron. Okay. Good. You're good. busy, busy, busy with your cursor, but we couldn't hear you. <laughs> All right. So just to reiterate, this is the measurement model that that David has been been working with. It has the safety, mindfulness, and absorptive constructs, and and a number of items that are are loading on each. And what I'm going to walk you through here conceptually is. Uh, uh, how to test for for metric invariance, and then that's invariance in in, in the factor loadings. Uh, so, and I sent out a video on how this is done, so you can uh, uh, look at that one afterwards as well. But I'll also go through it here, both on a conceptual level uh, as well as um, uh, looking at Amos. All right, let's see here. Yes, so. In order to test for metric invariance, which is invariance in the factor loading, first we do a full test of, of invariance for all the factor loadings at the same time. So we're basically comparing an unconstrained model to a, a model where all the factor loadings are constrained simultaneously to be equal uh, across groups. And, and if this shows invariance, then we're basically done. Uh, on the other hand, most of the time this is not going to to show invariance, and we'll have to uh, go into and see for each construct if we can find uh, any uh, invariance in, or any a source of variance in any of these constructs. And if we can identify variance constructs, then we can delve even further in and, and look at each factor loading individually for, for invariance. So let's have a look quickly in Amos to see how, how this is done. So I have my uh, model here. Let me see here. This is the model that we're going to use. So I, I've set up the model. And here, you don't need to have means uh, and intercepts because we're not testing uh, that so far. So the model is set up with, with two groups. Uh, and, and the variances here are constrained to one, as, as we're, we're used to. And you can see that for all the factor loadings, as I shift between the groups, you can see how they have been labeled uh, with uh, different labels for the two groups. So what we're looking at now is literally unconstrained model where um, everything's free to vary. I've set up a number of models here. Uh, and the way I've set them up is, is through clicking the multiple groups analysis and specifying the constraints that I want. And then you can also subsequently uh, edit um, uh, the constraints in the manage models uh, box. I'm going to show you how to how to do that. So the first model that we're going to test is full measurement invariance. So this looks like this. Here you have all the factor loadings constrained to be equal across the two groups. So A1-1, this factor loading here, equal to A1-2 which is the same factor loading, but in the, the other group. Uh, so let's first test that model and then see what we get. And here's the text output. You click model comparison and assuming model unconstrained to be correct. We're just going to look at this first row here. <coughs> and here we can see that this is a p-value that's below 0.05. And that means that there are significant differences in fit between the model which has full metric invariance and the model which is unconstrained. And therefore, we can't at this point claim that we have metric invariance for the model as a whole. So what we want to do next is that we want to uh, go in and, and constrain and, and look at the, the uh, constructs one at a time. So I, I built a number of other models here, one for mindfulness, one for safety and one for absorptive. So let's have a look at those. First, the model for safety. This is a model where we only constrain these three factor loadings. So that allows us to test whether there's invariance only in this construct. And we let everything else vary. And I've done the same for absorptive. So here we have all of these items. And for mindfulness. So. And actually, I've already run these models, so we can just go back to the outputs. But if you haven't 
uh, put the models in at this point, you need to rerun your model for pressing calculate estimates, and then we go to the text output again. So now we can look at these lines one at a time. You can see here for the mindfulness construct, we can see that we have a p-value of 0.66. And that means uh, that they're not significantly different from each other. The model which is fully unconstrained and the model where we've only constrained uh, the factor loading for mindfulness. So mindfulness, uh, we don't really need to worry about. If we look about invariance for absorptive, we can see again here that this is also not significantly different from the unconstrained model. So we have a good case for uh, metric invariance for absorptive and mindfulness. Now, however, when we look at invariance for safety, we can see here that when we constrain all the factor loadings for safety, this yields a model that's significantly different from a model that is completely unconstrained. So it seems that the safety construct is the source uh, of our metric variance here. However, we would like to locate the uh, the source of the, the variance on an item level. Because it could be the case that there's only some of these items that are showing variance, whereas others are actually invariant. And this uh, has consequences for uh, our scalar um, invariance analysis. Remember how Jake Deep told us that uh, we need these to be paired up, metric invariance and scalar invariance for each item. So it's important for us to understand not only that it's the safety construct that's problematic and variant here, but which of the particular items. So I created further new models, and it's one for each of these items. So these are basically models where all the items in the model have been constrained except for that particular one. So if we look at Q46, for example, you can see Forty-eight. Okay, so here we actually have forty-six. <clears throat> so there's been a mistake here. So here you can see how everything's constrained except for A11 and A12. If you look at Q49. Huh? And that's 48. So there's been and Q46 here. Yes, this is where A32 is missing. So this is Q49. I'm sorry there. Uh, there's just some small mistakes. So now these should be, be correct. So we can close this and we can test these. So Aaron, it's Lori. Um, before you were constraining the each line for the ones that you're testing, now you're not constraining them? So when we constrain one item at a time, what we're getting is, is to check whether that item on its own is invariant. When okay. we're constraining all items except for one, mm -hmm. that is a test of uh, whether everything else is invariant except for that item. Gotcha. Thank you. So if we run this and uh, go back to our output, we can see here that um, if you look at the model here for Q46, we can see that a model where everything else uh, besides Q46 has been constrained, it's on the verge uh, of um, uh, being uh, invariant, because uh, the p-value is still below 0.5, but it's still fairly high. Uh, so in a way, you could argue that this model is significantly different from the unconstrained model where, where Q46 uh, is, is free. If you look at invariance for safety, you'll see that even when we constrain everything except for Q48, this is still significantly different. 
and a model where everything except for Q49 is constrained is still uh, uh, is not uh, significantly different from an unconstrained model. So in this particular case, what we can say is basically that for Q46 and Q48, these are our borderline items, and it might come back to to haunt us before uh, later. But the biggest source of problem here is Q49, because it doesn't seem like metric invariance holds uh, for this particular item. So mm -hmm. that's going to have consequences when we move on to test for scalar invariance. Can you bring up those results one more time, Aaron? So here, I'm going to move yeah. the control back to Jagdeep, and he's going to clarify a couple of points. Can you go back to that, we had the numbers, so we can look at that? Thanks, the actual, Dave. Yeah, welcome. Uh, yes, uh, just working through this. Any questions uh, on the metric uh, invariance? Just um, the stage in. Um, that whole safety construct, um, I mean, you know, you can kind of say there's a the, uh, Q48 is the worst of them, but they're all pretty bad. Well, uh, the safety, I think what we see out there, the thing on the whole is how the safety construct behaves as a But you're right, safety is the most problem. Jack D. It's hard to hear you now. Yeah, we can't hear you. Is it hard to hear me? Yes, we can't hear you. So let me get the let me get the control back. Maybe that one. Well, I think you have to request it because I don't know. Problem one. This is Lori. The item you picked as being the problem one. That was the one with the 0 0.024 p-value. That's right. Thank you. That's right. Could you go back to the slide that showed the the loadings and the significance, or no? Um, how can we go back? Uh, I'm on a different place. Um, this one happened. This one. Hey, but but it's like, it's not, video. Since we're taking control from Aaron back to me, I can't get that output. But can you ask the question so we can an answer? That's okay. I, I think that's Dave, fine. Dave, but it's, it, it's in his video. If you watch his video, he walks through that entire thing that he just did. Yeah, I can find it. So, what I'm going to do is. Uh, now, this is a good time. If you guys want to break for a few minutes and stretch out, this is a good time to do it because once we get going, we have to finish what you see on the screen at the moment, which is a sequence of four steps. And I'll lay this out in a systematic fashion so you can uh, see it and apply it to your own work. So tell me, you guys want to break at this time or are you good? So, I just soon finish. Yeah. 
But I don't see anything on my screen. Am I on the wrong screen? No, to, there's nothing on the set. screen. Okay, good. Oh, there's nothing on the screen? No. Okay. No. no. Oh, We're back to the blank screen. I mean, the one with the headset and the little people. Oh, I see. Yeah. Got it. Sorry. Sorry. I'm doing Yeah, let's keep going. So, wait. Yeah. I can't get it. Um, I went and moved it. Back while we're waiting, I've got a question. Which mindfulness scale did you use? All right. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, the, um, um, yeah? There, there was a question about mindfulness, and I thought, I'd answer that quickly. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, Wiki, there was a, a collective, collective mindfulness article written by Wiki, the 2001 Managing the Unexpected, Assuring High Performance in an Age of Complexity. So I can send you the article if you like. They were pretty well defined in that article. Yeah, no, I, I, know, I know why it uh, worked. My question then is, why did you use collective mindfulness and not individual mindfulness? Well, we are specifically looking for the company's responses, not individuals, even though the individuals are the ones responding. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we begin? Okay, Jagdeep, this, this slide is not part of the slide deck that we were sent out. Are you going to send it to us when we get a chance? It, it should be. Um, well, you should be able to download it from the WebEx. Yeah, that, that like is a whole mystery to how that works. Yeah, you Aaron, could send it out as an email. Yeah. yeah, Aaron's right. That's not part of the slide deck that was sent out. Okay, you know, I, you're going to see what we can do. Just hold on. So you, you can't access the uh, excuse me. I want to just tell them how to get it. Oh, so you can't access the file that we uh, uh, uploaded to the web app? I'm not Aaron, seeing that option. Aaron, you sent about six or seven emails, so it'll take us five or ten minutes to go through each email to figure out what's going on. How do you want this to be sent? What do you send, it, send it to an, e an email to us, the, the class, DM213. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah so, just the whole deck. Yeah. So Aaron is going to send an email with that attachment. And I, really, I do think it would be helpful if you had this part of the uh, presentation open as we walk through it. So, give me a second. I'm um, David, this is Adrian, while we were working. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, Philip was asking about the unit of analysis, and uh, I, I was going to ask you the same question because, as far as I know, absorptive capacity, not the not the construct Philip asked about, but that is only at the organizational level. So I, that makes sense what you were saying. Yeah, you know, um, we wrestled back and forth, Callie and I and James. And, uh, you know, at the, what we're trying to do is attract the, the top 10 or 20 executives of each company, hoping that they represent them the organization. So that's the reason why. All right. I think the email has gone out, so make sure we can uh, open it and, and get to this slide. I got it. Good. Yep. I'm going to focus on the left most the left box. That's what I'm going to do. 
And the way I've structured this is to say what should we be doing to the loading? By loading, I mean item loading. Intercept, I mean item intercept. Latent mean, that's for the factor. And latent variant. So C would say. If you can add it to the mic, we can, I can hardly hear you. Cost one to invariant value in both groups. What that means is that we just finished the metric invariant. So the loading which is invariant, take any one for each factor. You must fix the loading for that item to the value you obtain during metric invariant. The intercept for that item, for the same item, should be constrained to be equal in the two groups. The latent mean to be fixed to zero in the reference group, and a latent variance to be fixed to unity, one, in the reference group only. So this is our identification at the bottom, and the top one uh, to help us get the intercepts estimate. Now, for the same pair to be equal, and here is the intercept I61, that's the intercept for this item. And if I get, change the group to service providers or to producers, the value is exactly the same, I61. So, and you can see all groups are checked here, so the same value is being estimated. That's true not only for this, it's true for this one as well, I21. You can see all groups are checked. The same intercept, and finally for I12 one, all groups checked. For all the remaining items, the intercepts are free to be estimated. Good example is here: Q46, all groups are not checked. Q49, not checked. 14, not checked, and so on throughout the entire analysis. A deep question. Mm -hmm. um, the factor loadings come from the, I don't know, when you call it a control group and a, the non-control group, but which one did it come from? See, because they're set to be equal in the metric invariance, they have to be the same value. Okay, got it. Got it? So we have to choose that item which has, which met the property of metric invariance. We can't choose any other item. So we did not choose Q39 here because it did not meet the property, but we can choose any of the other items. You will also notice the loadings of the items which have met the invariance property are set to be equal. So you remember in mindfulness, each of the items was invariant. So we can see here for this item, first Q14, the loading is A42 in one of the groups, and it's the same in the second group, A42. So the same value in both the groups, so that the loading is set to be equal as you found in the metric invariant one. That will be true for this one. Uh, the loading for Q16, same reason, it should be identical in the two. And in this case, all groups are not checked, but the value here is exactly the same, A62, either if I do producers or I do service calls. And that will be true for all of these loadings, which are found to be invariant in the initial value. So you fix one value to a given value, set its intercept to be equal, all other intercepts are free. The loadings are constrained to be equal as you found in the metric index. Are we good? Yep. All right. And uh, you see a bunch of uh, these um, marriage models. I use them very freely. So I keep adding, um, I deleted some so that we won't have too much complication. But what do I want to test here? My main test is whether the intercepts for the items are identical in the two groups or not. I cannot do any testing unless I show that. So my first marriage model is naturally 
the uh, all intercept constraint uh, analysis, and it has all the intercepts from the two groups to be set to equal, so I can test if they are equal or not. And if they're not going to be equal, I want to do it by individual constructs. So I have one for safety intercepts, the two of them, because one of them has been set to be equal, so I can only use two, one less. Similarly, for mindfulness, I have three of them. There were four items. One has been set to equal, so I'm checking the remaining three. And finally, the exhaustive capacity. We have six items, so I should have five of them. And you can supply there to check if the intercepts are equal or not. And with that, I can run this analysis and see what I find. That's my run. You want to always check the notes on the model to make sure there are no strange findings. There, there seem to be none. Uh, you want to check in model fit if uh, the model has good fit to begin with. And usually you can go to RMSCA. You can see most of them are uh, non-significant. They're borderline, but they're not significant. So we are fine. And finally, we want to go to model comparison to see the results of a different hypothesis. The first one, if there's all intercepts constrained, and here is the hypothesis testing. Now, no hypothesis that they're equal. The p-value is going to the three-fold. So we reject the null that the intercepts are equal. Unfortunate for us because we would like to see that uh, we accept this null hypothesis in order to claim scalar invariance and move forward. But the p value is borderline, so there's a hope that this can be done with a partial scalar invariance. Indeed, for the safety intercepts, if the p value is 0.276, non significant for mindfulness. So, mindfulness has turned out to be a great construct. Uh, all of the items meet metric invariance. If intercepts meet the uh, scalar invariance, very good. Absorptive is a problem because it has 1, 2, 3, 4. So absorptive doesn't have the right um, uh, hypothesis outcome. So you want to test for each one of them. Those tests are clear at the bottom here. You can see here. Uh, we do all of the five items. And you can see by looking at it, the most critical one is 38, with 0 0.001. And 39 is close enough to 0 0.008. So two of the five items for which we had, um, uh, had relaxed the intercepts, uh, they don't need the property, but three of them seem to be OK. Are we good? Any question at this point? Yeah, um, oops, sorry, David Adrian. Um, so I'm just trying to processing this as you're talking, so I may not be as fast as uh, as you are. But um, so there are six items on absorptive capacity, and one of them you had was fixed. So how do you how do you make sure that that sixth one is not a problem? Um, Oh, did anyone hear what I said? Yeah, I heard you again. Hey, Adrian, I did hear you. I did hear okay. you. And, I, and what I said is that uh, uh, to answer your question, I need to go to my next one. You anticipated my question very well. So I need this, and I need this. Let's go back to. So we have done this testing now. We, we tested for invariance of intercept. Now we're going to do this piece of it and we'll answer the question that Adrian asked. We constrain all the invariant intercepts and loadings. Earlier we only did the loadings. Now we're going to constrain both the intercepts and the loadings. And I'm going to do the following. Release the fixed loading, meaning the loading we had fixed earlier 
do that fixed value on a metric invariant, I'm going to make it free. But I'm going to constrain all the invariant loading from the metric invariant. I'm going to release the fixed intercept. The intercept is here fixed to be equal. I'm going to release that now and test if that is invariant or not. And I'm going to leave the mean and invariance the same as before, fix to zero in the reference group, and fix the unity in the reference group. Oh. So the question may be now is exactly what we're going to address next, and that is this one. Are we good to proceed? Sure. Yeah. Are people sleeping away and sitting on the line and enjoying themselves? Good. All right, let me uh, go to the next step, um, which is uh, uh, this second run. What I'm going to do here now is, if you remember, uh, for safety, this was the item uh, Q48, which we had set the loading to be a big number. We had constrained it, intercept to be equal. I'm going to change that now. Uh, so the loading, if you notice here, is on A21, and in the other group, it is also set to be equal to A21. Typically, we should have released it, but we cannot because we need at least two items to identify the safety construct. And I'll come to that in a minute. But its intercept we're going to make free is to uh, I12 1 and uh, the other one, oh, this is the same one. Maybe I changed the other one. So, Q13 1, and the second one is Q13 2, and here it is A11 2, and A11 1. And I want to show you the mindfulness. I can Q15. We have set it loading to a fixed value. Now I'm giving it a label, A51 in group one, and in the second group is A52, so I'm testing it. The intercept is I22, and in the first group it is I21, so I'm going to test if this intercept is uh, different or not. Finally, I believe the item in the software is Q35, which you have to a fixed value. Again, A91 in group one, and A92 in group two, and intercept I62 in group 2 and I61 in group 1. So I'm going to test the things I had constrained earlier to make sure, sure that they are also invariant. The other intercepts are found to be equal. I'm going to make them equal now. So in mindfulness, if you remember, all items had equal intercepts. So if I say Q14, uh, Q17, you see all those checked there, meaning the intercept is identical. Similarly for 16, identical. 15, to be left open because this we had constrained earlier, and 14 to be equal. We do that for each of the constructs so that we can circle back and check if uh, those items which we had fixed before also have invariants. And you can see I have Set the hypotheses for the metric models for each of the items. Q38, I'll check for that. Uh, then mindfulness is Q15, this one here. Then absorptive Q35, which I have set. And absorptive Q39, which has not met the intersect property before. So I'm going to test that again. Yeah, maybe it's yeah, ready to proceed. Any questions? Yeah, Jagdeep, in the last analysis, you identified which of the factors, which of the items were variant. Mm -hmm. And in your slide, you say that what we're going to do is we're going to fix the invariant ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in this example, how you, have, you fixed all of them. You didn't yeah. just fix the invariant ones. No, I, I did. So the one we found to be invariant was 239 and 238 for the absorptive. So in this case, if you notice, the intercept is 
I ten one and good one and log the two. Oh, I see. It's not so what you did is the invariant ones you put, you yes. check the all groups. Yes. Okay. Exactly. okay. So we did step by step, whatever we find for the invariant, we take them invariant. Right. And then we go to test the next step to see what is okay. the remaining evidence. In this case, because some of them we had uh, forced them to be equal, we want to go back and check. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, just, you know, it's just really odd that, uh, it's Adrian, that uh, the safety items were really kind of flaky and metric. Uh, variance yeah. testing, but in scalar they seem to be fine. Yeah. Just the opposite with absorptive. Yeah. Very yeah. odd. Very odd. And I, I think the, the problem is that in order for us to work, the, the item we maintain to be invariant must satisfy both problems. So if they satisfy one but not the other, not useful. All right, so I'm going to run this. To, uh, it's already done, actually, so I'm going to see the output and what we find. Uh, as, it, as in all of them, we first want to make sure there are no problems in estimation. the case. Usually, you should be looking at the estimates also and saying they're not all. The kind of errors of the people is a usually giveaway. If they are not of the same magnitude, it means your estimation has not been watched properly. In this case, it looks very nice. Now, but I can tell you, to get us to make this work, we have to do many runs, and many times we made errors. So this is a useful place. I go to check uh, if the model is converged properly. Always look at model fits to make sure that uh, the model fit is good. And you can see now the p closes are getting better as we are really capitalizing on chance by Fixing the things that are in there. But our real interest is model comparison, and here are the results uh, that we're interested in. 15 percent, I just checked that again, didn't see the same result, but not very useful because the items don't meet the property of uh, uh, metric in there. So let's look at the remaining items from absorptive and uh, mindfulness. Mindfulness first. Remember the item we had fixed uh, the intercept to be equal, the p value is 0 0.08, which means good item again. So mindfulness uh, as a construct is a very strong construct. Every item, even the one we had forced to be equal, meets the property of both metric and scalar. Great item. Absorptive, Q39 is very clean. 35, the one we had forced to be equal, is actually the most offending. It is 0.021 and is causing the problem. Actually, once we release Q35, the Q38 became non significant. Very common. You may see that earlier on in the analysis, Q38 was the problem, but no, it was only a reflection of the problem. The real problem is Q35, which we happen to, by random selection, constrain its intercept to be equal, not justified. So we could constrain 38 of 39, but not 35. So absorptive has partial invariance, uh, but it does not uh, meet full invariance condition because of 235, not 38, or Are we good? Yeah. Say yes, if we're good. Yes, it's good. Yes. So, all right. Yes. Just, yes all right. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to close this because this is this part of the analysis is over. Let me go back to uh, so what we did here. And then uh, I finished this piece. Now I'm going to come down to what I show here. Uh, so here it says now constrain all the invariant loading and constrain all the invariant intercepts. So now we finish the analysis, we can keep we can go back and redo it. But now our goal is to constrain all of the invariant 
and constrain all of the interceptors are invariant. Fix the mean of one of the groups to zero and the variance to unity. And now we're going to test for a big invariance to be equal in the two groups. It says here it's equal to one, but actually what we're going to be doing is testing if the variance is equal or not. I'll explain how that works. Um, and what I'm going to do is pick up my next one, which is factor variance and variance. Here is that analysis. <clears throat> so in this analysis, you will see that all of the loading, none, there are no numbers anywhere uh, in the intercepts or anywhere else. Um, the, the ones which are constrained to be equal are the ones which were found to be uh, invariant. So for mindfulness, for every item, I should find that they're equal, and I can check that. Let's say 14 uh, parameters. It says I11, all those are checked. Very good. And I want to make sure the loading is the same way. Uh, all this is not checked. Which means I must make sure that A42 is the same label in the two groups. I'm going to see producers and service providers, same way. So it is in fact the same thing as checking all groups. And I should find that Q35 here should not have either the loading or the intercept to be equal. Why? Because they have to be in pair. Although Q35 had invariant loading, I must release it now because it does not need the scalar invariance property. And you can see that all groups is not checked. I62 in group 2 and I61 in group 1. The loading is A91, A91 in group 1 and A92 in group 2. So we just follow the basic idea to be consistent in the way we constrain and unconstrain. The key here is what I'm going to do with the Variance. I'm going, to, I'm going to test if the variance of this latent variable is equal in the two groups or not. I have said in the reference group, we're going to set to 0 and 1. So each one of them you can see is set to 0 and 1. In group 2, the mean is left open, but I have a label just for this reason because I want to test if it's equal or not. So each of the latent constructs has a label as you can see on the top, ABS law 2, and I want to test equality. And I do this by something here. So if I open this method model, it's testing for all variances. Why do I do all variances, all intercepts, and all that? Because if you do individual comparison, that's not a good practice. We should always begin with the omnibus test, and putting all of them together. When that is rejected, then we do subsets. Never go to the individual right away. Subsets meaning by individual construct, as it's not before. So in this case, we're dealing with all of them together. And notice what I do here. I say as wa 2, that is the variance of absorptive capacity, equals to 1. Remember, in the reference group, we had set it equal to 1. So I'm going to test if this is also equal to 1. So that's what I'm doing. And you will notice I do that for safety, I do that for mindfulness, and I do that for exhaustive. Just in case my overall hypothesis was rejected. If the overall was not rejected, I would not look at the individual. Good. Can you proceed? Say yes. 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 All right. No question. Okay. So I'm going to look at the output now. Uh, what the output looks like. Again, we begin by the note the model to make sure everything is okay. SMX, look at the center error. All should be similar in range. They are. Let's look at model fit. And we can go down to this close. All of the students for me. And I want to see model comparison. 
uh, we can see safety variance not equal, but for mindfulness and absorptive capacity, they are equal because the p value is not equal. So you can pretty much see that the safety construct is a problem, but mindfulness and absorptive capacity solid constructs can be used for understanding differences in groups. Everyone good? So now we are just bracing for our last analysis. I had said in the beginning the whole purpose of doing all this stuff is to make inferences about latent means and latent slopes. This model, in which we have correlations among the three variables, is no use to us because there is no hypothesis of uh, paths which we can test. Um, so this is not the right way to think about it. So I'm going to change the model. But before I do that, I want to emphasize that up to this point, it's probably a good idea to leave these correlations in and not worry about the path. Although the model you're interested in is going to look like this. That's what your model is going to look like. I made a very simple model. Safety and mindfulness lead to adopted capacity. Uh, there are two coefficients to be estimated. These are my structural coefficients. I want to know if these paths are different or not. Now I am ready to do it. So I need to now change those correlations to place two of them in the path. But the moment you do that, all things go haywire. And you need to readjust yourself a little bit. And I noted that um, uh, in my in the PowerPoint, only by saying estimate structural model. This piece here has some um, more to it than what it seems. Let me explain. First, uh, this is the dependent variable, the exhaustive capacity. This is where the most of changes are. Because it's a dependent variable now, you can't set its variance to any value and so on. So what we have to do is we have to set one of this loading to a fixed value. I don't choose one. I choose a value, which in this case is 0.397, which is the exact value estimated in my last one, the scalar invariant one. So I pick up the value from there, and I use that value again. Notice the intercept is 4.015. How did I get it? This is exactly the intercept of 234 in that scalar invariant one. And I make it equal in the two groups, so all groups should check. And this will make it a way to identify the absorptive function. <clears throat> Are we good? Yes. Yep. Yes, we're good. Good. Any questions? All right. There are no questions, so we understand that. Now, the other thing I did was the absorptive capacity. The intercept in group one is set to zero, as we expect in the reference group. In the second group, service provider, I give it a name as mean two to be estimated. Very interested. Is it mean different than the two groups or not? That's it, like that. Similarly, for safety, I have SF mean and SR to be estimated in the second group. Similarly, for mindfulness, the MF mean and MF bar. Very interested to know if mindfulness will differ in the two groups or not. So that didn't require any change except giving a label to the mean because I'm interested in it now. All other stuff remains the same. Nothing has changed. The only change is here and the intercept for itself. Oh, one more thing. I added the other variance for the latent construct, which is to get your R squared. And the only hypothesis I want to test of great concern to me would be for slopes and means. Here is the Maddox model's idea for um, slopes. I'm testing it. 
the coefficients are equal or not in the two groups. You may say, so what happened to the mean? Well, remember the mean of both cost lots in the two groups, in the, in the reference group is zero, whereas in the second group it is some value at mean, at mean. And I have to test if this mean is equal to zero or not, which I will show you in a moment when I go to the output. So that's the output. And I run this. Again, the overall model should be good. Estimates should be of a similar standard errors. They are. Model comparison. Uh, model fit, I say. Model fit, we can see P code is 0.158. It's very reasonable. We can look at other fit indices like uh, um, IFI and TLI and CFI. Just make sure they're fine. Uh, model comparison shows that the hypothesis of equal slopes is not rejected, but it is, is accepted. So the two slopes are equal in the two groups. So that's the latent slopes, they are identical. What about the means? The means happen to be in this part of scale. That's where the means are. And you want to know means for the two groups, producers and service providers. You want to know it when the coefficient are set to equal, so I'm going to click on all coefficient models. And I'm going to go to the intercepts uh, first. The first intercept shown is adds mean 2. That's for the service provider. The estimate mean value is 0 0.407. So it's saying that in the service sample, the absorptive capacity had a mean of 0 0.407, whereas in the producer group, the mean was still. So you're always comparing with respect to the reference group. Whether it is significant or not, this hypothesis testing is always done traditionally, whether 0 0.407 is equal to zero or not. So this p value is highly significant. So you reject the null hypothesis that the mean is equal to zero, which means that the service group mean or adopted capacity is significantly different from the mean value of the producer. And this goes back to my beginning. I said in many studies, slopes might be identical, and you may conclude that there are no differences wrong. There could be differences in vacant mean, and this is the result from it. This is a very powerful uh, result because this is a, not a mean difference on individual items, it's not a mean difference on composite like a NOAA would do. It's a mean difference after controlling for measurement factors. And if you had common method and you had other ways of controlling biases, this would be even more uh, vigorous test of the like mean. You may say, what happened to the other two means? Well, here are the means for mindfulness and safety. And as you can see, the mindfulness and the key value of 0 0.062. So the mean for mindfulness does not differ between the Safety mean does differ by a huge amount, 0.928. Telescope is marked far more positive than the producer group on safety. And it is significant. Uh, at a very high level. The only problem is safety is a construct cannot be trusted. So this this particular text is not very credible because the scalar invariant and the metric invariance for this construct is not different. That in nutshell concludes my presentation and you should have all of these um famous slides with playbook and the data files that work with, and um, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to answer the questions. Now. Thank you for going through all of that, Jagdeep. We really appreciate it. Uh, Jagdeep, I've got a question. Um, in this particular, in this particular case, you had a very, very simple. Yeah. Uh, model. And for the last step where you're estimating the structural model, if you have seven constructs, 
it doesn't matter how you're uh, you, you connect them causally as your theory would no. would lay out. That's right. That's okay. Right. It, it, I think uh, uh, it doesn't get more complicated with more constructs. Uh, the only uh, requirement is you must have good measurement. If you have that, things work out very clean. Yeah, well, this is very impressive. Uh, very extensive. <laughs> yeah, it's good. But I just want to emphasize, you know, that when you're doing hypothesis testing, you miss out means, you are missing out differences that are quite relevant. Can you imagine in a real setting, you say performance levels may differ in the two groups, and you have missed it out completely because you've never estimated it in means. Okay, any other questions uh, from those who have had the courage to stay back and listen? Uh, do I have no questions? <clears throat> Can we close it back at this time? Give me a yes or no? I'd say yes. I say yes. <laughs> I think I think this has been good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I did want to hear some yeses, and the hope that I'm not just talking to Adrian. So with that, uh, I close this session, and thanks for taking the time to be with us. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of things will come up when we start using it. Uh, just wait for the videos from Aaron. Work through it yourself, and then. Question and pick it up as a residency. Enjoy your wine. I surely will. And you all have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank all you. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Yeah, I have a very nice one, but I just didn't bring it. Thank you.